All right. Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you guys for coming to talk about uh, a subject that's really near and dear to my heart, which is emergency radiology. It's become my area of academic interest. In full disclosure, I am married to a radiologist, so that may contribute to part of it. Um, I cleared all the radiology jokes through her, so it's OK. Um, and it's, like Rick said, I think it is a valuable skill, and it's really an integral skill to emergency medicine. And we wouldn't dream of not interpreting our own EKGs, and I don't see why we would dream of not interpreting our own x-rays. So we're going to do sort of a whirlwind tour of plain radiography with you guys. And we're going to start with the chest x-ray. And at least my residents can't believe that we're still doing these old-fashioned x-rays. They're like, why aren't we ultrasounding? Why aren't we CAT scanning? Isn't it old-fashioned technology? And in a way it is, but it is still incredibly valuable. And it's still, plain radiography represents the majority of imaging that we get. Like Rick said, it really is the bread and butter or the workhorse of the department. And none, I think, more than a chest x-ray. No matter what anyone comes in for, they get a chest x-ray, right? And part of the reason why I think this is still such a valuable skill is you may be the one who needs to make the read. And if you think about what's inside the chest, there are a lot of important parts in there, right? Heart, great vessels, lungs. You may have to make a diagnosis very quickly that is potentially life-saving. And so as we go through this, I want you to sort of put yourself in the radiologist spot. They're in a, reading in a vacuum. They're in a dark room. They don't know the patient. You do. And as we go through this, I'm going to emphasize over and over again that history in the physical exam can really influence how we interpret these films. So our objectives today are pretty simple, and they're going to be the same for all of the plain film lectures. We're going to talk about a systematic way to, to look at these, and I drill my residents on this over and over and over again. You need to do it the same way every time, because when you don't, that's when mistakes happen. I'm going to talk about some common abnormal findings for some pretty common disease entities that you guys are going to be seeing. And I also want to talk about some of the pitfalls, because it is sometimes challenging to look at these. Quick show of hands, who here actually has seen plain radiographs, like held an x-ray? All right, that makes me feel a little bit better, because <laughs> our residents have never actually held a film. And when a patient shows up transferred in, they actually have plain films. This is what they look like. They have no idea what to do with them. I don't even think we have a light box left in our department. Chest x-rays in particular, even though there's black and white, there really are shades of gray. And like I said, the history and physical exam really influence how we interpret them. And I like to call them the medical Rorschach drawing, right? So you can sort of squint your eyes and say, yeah, maybe there's a little pneumonia there. Or, yeah, maybe they look a little wet. Whatever it takes to like, get them admitted, right? Um, but you really should be using that history and physical. And again, you need to be systematic. And first things first, when you look at an x-ray, and I know this sounds very basic, but make sure it's the right patient. And I know that sounds silly, but in this era of electronic imaging, it's very easy to click the wrong patient or click the wrong x-ray. So make sure it's the right patient and the right study. The next thing you want to do is look at the film markers. You want to make sure that left is really left. Our PAC system had a glitch in it a few years ago and started flipping images. And somebody almost got a wrong-sided chest tube because of it. So you really would just take a quick look and make sure left is really left. The next thing is you want to evaluate the film technique. And what I mean by that is, how was that film taken? Was the patient upright? Was it a PA film? Or was the patient supine and an AP film? Because that alone can have dramatic impact on how we interpret the film. And I'll show you some examples of that. The next thing with chest x-rays that you want to do is you want to assess the adequacy. And there's four big things that go into it. Penetration is one, inspiration, rotation, and then completeness. Are we seeing everything that we need to see on the film? Penetration, x-rays are not a one-size-fits-all dose. And so the uh, x-ray tech will dial up or down the amount of radiation they use based on their judge of the patient's body habitus. For an x-ray to be adequately penetrated to interpret, you should be able to make out the lower thoracic vertebrae through the heart. You don't want to see them in great detail like you would with a T-spine film, because that means the lungs are burnt out and you're not able to interpret it, but you should be able to make out the outlines of it. 
The next is inspiration. Typically, we take an X-ray, a chest X-ray, in full inspiration. And the way that we assess for that is we count the ribs. So on the right side, as you count down the ribs, the 10th or 11th rib should be right at the intersection where that number 10 is of the heart and the diaphragm, the cardiophrenic sulcus there. Films that are not adequately inspired make everything squished together. It makes the heart look bigger than it is. It makes the lungs look more congested than they are and can really influence how you interpret something. Rotation. Rotation is actually really important. It's something I don't think we think enough about. In order to assess for rotation, you want to look at bony landmarks. You don't want to use something like the trachea because it's mobile and things can sort of shift it around. You want to look at bony landmarks. So you look at the clavicular heads, which are here, and then you find the tip of the spinous process behind it, and it should be right in the middle of that space. That means the patient was, you know, the plate was equal, equally placed on the patient. In cases where they're rotated, what that means is that one lung is in closer contact to the x-ray plate than the other. And so that can influence the appearance of that lung field. And in this case, this patient um, is a supine trauma patient. And when I look at those lungs, the right lung looks more loosened, looks darker than the left. The left looks hazy to me. And in a supine trauma patient, that concerns me for a hemothorax because it's going to layer up this way, not this way. All right, so little things like rotation can actually have a big influence on how the film looks. It can also make the mediastinum look much bigger than it is, which again, in a trauma patient is sort of a big deal. And the last thing is completeness. You really got to be able to see everything on the film that you want. So oftentimes the costophrenic angles get cut off. You guys know this. Also, a true complete extra chest x-ray series is an AP and a, or a PA and a lateral. So you really, if at all possible, should be getting a lateral chest x-ray as well because a lot can hide behind the heart back there. So how do we interpret it? So we've gone through, it's the right study, we've assessed the technique, we've assessed for adequacy. How do we read these things? And there's lots of methods out there that you'll see and that people use. I think a common one that's taught is the geographic approach. And by that I mean you start at the outside and work your way in, or start on the inside and work your way out. The problem I have with that approach is something I call the happy eyes phenomenon. So all too often what happens as you're looking, if you see something obvious, you stop. You get happy eyes. And you don't look at the rest of the film. And that's how things get missed. The next approach is the targeted approach. And this is what I think a lot of us do in practice. You know, somebody comes in with a fever and a cough, you want to rule out pneumonia, you get a chest x-ray and you look at the lungs to look for pneumonia. And you may miss the shoulder dislocation, the clavicle fracture, all the other stuff that could be on that film. So the method that I like and that I try and uh, drill my residents on are the ABCs. And you're going to see I use the ABCs a lot in radiology. They work really well. And the reason why I like this is because it provides you a systematic framework for you to read this, the film the same way every single time. This is a lot of all these cases actually are from my home shop. A lot of them were my own screw ups, so I'm happy to share those with you today. Um, and this was a case that I had that really resonated with me early in my uh, attending career. And it was a really unfortunate 21 year old male. He had pretty severe MR, CP, he had a known seizure disorder. And he seized and he aspirated right in front of us. It was like clear as day. He was tachycardic, he was tachypnic, he was hypoxic, like he, he did a good job. And we got an x-ray. And sure enough, when we look at it, he's got a big right middle lobe consolidation. All right, so done. We admitted him for his hypoxia. And the mom kept coming out of the room. And she's like, something's wrong with my son. He's not acting right. I know him, something's wrong. And I was like, yeah, he's got this aspiration, you know, he's got this pneumonia, he's, he'll be fine, shoo shoo. And uh, finally, the radiologist came out, which you know is never a good sign, right? They come out, the bright lights are blinding them, right? You, so you know it's got to be something serious for them to come out of their room. And he's like, Bob, what's going on with this guy? I said, what do you mean? He's got a pneumonia, he had an aspiration. He's like, yeah, I haven't seen any post reductions come by. And if you look on the left, his shoulder's dislocated. So this poor kid dislocated when he sees, and I let him sit there for hours because I wasn't systematic. And that really scared me. This was like sort of an eye-opening case. Like, if I couldn't see this on an x-ray, what else am I missing? So it really started me sort of down this pathway 
trying to develop a system and doing it every time. And the more you do it, the more intuitive it becomes, and you don't even have to think about it. So the ABCs, airway, bones, cardiomediastinum, diaphragms, everything else, and by that I mean line and tube placement, foreign bodies, air under the diaphragm, air in the mediastinal space, everything else. And then F is for fields, lung fields. And that's why I like this method the most, because it's human nature. When you put a chest x-ray up in front of somebody, they're going to look at the lungs. And particularly like that last case, if there's a finding there, they just stop. And I've seen this over and over and over again. If you do this method, you look at the lungs last, and that way you don't miss anything. All right, so let's look at some cases. So this guy comes in, 42-year-old male, pretty healthy, comes in with a couple days of fever and a cough. And we get an x-ray, and we go through our method, and it's actually pretty adequate. His diaphragms are a little flat, he's a little hyperinflated, but he has this big, dense consolidation, which is pretty consistent with the pneumonia. It's what we were expecting to see. So now the question is, where is it? How do we localize these on a flat image? And what you notice is there's no right heart border anymore. It just merges with this consolidation in the lung. And by that, I know that the right middle lobe sits up against the right heart there. And because I can't see that interface now, I know that that pneumonia is in the right middle lobe. X-rays, I like to say, are a study in contrast. In order for you to see a border between one thing and another, they have to be of different densities. So normally you have air-filled lungs sitting up against dense heart. You see a border there. Now you have pus-filled lung sitting dense, sitting up against dense heart, and you lose that border. And this is what's known as one of the silhouette signs in radiology. And it's really a misnomer. It's really the loss of silhouette. But we use these silhouette signs and this concept of different densities to help localize things. So like I said, if you lose the right heart border, it's typically in the right middle lobe. If you lose the right hemidiaphragm, it's typically in the right lower lobe. And if you lose the left upper heart border, it's typically in the lingula. So it just helps us localize where these lesions are. This guy comes in, very similar story. And at first glance, the radiograph looks very similar, right? He's got this big, dense consolidation on the right. But if you look carefully at it, you can actually see, make out his right heart border pretty well. If you follow his hemidiaphragm over towards the heart, though, you start to lose it. And you lose it right about in there. And that tells me this is most likely a right lower lobe process going on. If we take a closer look at it, and I know this is hard to, to project well, if we take an even closer look, you see this sort of dark branching structure right there. Does everyone see that? That is what we call an air bronchogram. Normally, you don't see the smaller bronchi because they're air-filled tubes against air-filled alveoli. No difference in density there. But now what you have is air-filled bronchi surrounded by pus-filled consolidated alveoli, different density. So now you're able to see it. And it just really supports the diagnosis that this is most likely pneumonia. All right. This woman comes in. I'll never forget. I can even picture the room that she was in. 65-year-old lady, fairly healthy. She was obese. She had the usual hypertension, high cholesterol stuff. And she came in with pretty rapid onset of pretty severe left-sided pleuritic chest pain. She was short of breath. And you look at her vitals, she was tacky to the 120s, she was hypoxic to like 90% with no prior lung history. And this really just sort of came on out of the blue. So what are you guys thinking with that sort of story? Like PE, right? So we get an x-ray, and I took a quick look at it, and it does look a little hazy. It's mostly due to her body habitus. If you actually do go through, it is adequately penetrated. Nothing really serious jumped out at me, certainly nothing to explain her clinical picture. Here's her lateral, and again, I, nothing at the time really jumped out at me. However, when you look at her prior from a year ago, there are differences there. And so if you look at her prior, you can trace out her left hemidiaphragm behind the heart here. You can't do that today. We've lost that left hemidiaphragm behind the heart. 
when you look at her lateral from a year ago, you notice that as you go down the spine, it becomes darker, it becomes more lucent, that's normal. Today, however, it becomes brighter, it becomes more opaque. And that tells me that there's consolidated long sitting back there, or fluid or something. But given that I can see the angles of her diaphragm pretty well, it's most likely consolidated long. So this lady has a retrocardiac pneumonia. Radiology called it, to be fair. And I didn't believe him, because I'm like, it just doesn't fit clinically. You know, the time course, how she looks, that looks pretty subtle to me on plain film. So I did go ahead and scan her. And again, pretty formative case, because on her scan, you can see this big, dense, socked in, consolidated pneumonia sitting right there with that chest x-ray. So it was a great sort of illustrative case for me of just how much x-rays can underestimate the extent of pathology and also how much you need to respect those sort of subtle signs. They do actually mean something. And by the way, uh, it showed it as you go down, that's called the spine sign. When it becomes more opaque or brighter as you go down the spine, that's a spine sign. And you gotta look for that and respect it when you see it. This woman comes in, so 45-year-old woman, she had a couple of weeks of low-grade fever, cough, and she just didn't look good. She looked pretty sick. She was hypoxic, she was tachypnic. Her lungs sounded awful. And we got an x-ray. And as I look at it, it just, there's no obvious low bar consolidation. I didn't see like an obvious huge pneumonia, but just everything looks busy there. There's increased interstitial markings there. Everything is sort of hazy. Now, if I were to tell you that this was a 65-year-old guy with a history of CHF who went out for Chinese food and didn't take his Lasix, I could sort of buy that this is pulmonary edema. But that story is not what we had. We had a young woman with infectious symptoms. So that launches you down a whole different pathway. As I look, <laughs> I looked at the read, and it was your classic, you know, hedge. And so, you know, absolutely no help. But then you have to start to think of a differential. What causes this diffuse interstitial pattern in an infectious sort of uh, setting? And those are atypical pneumonias. And the things that we worry about are things like, you know, um, mycoplasma can do it, chlamydia can do it, um, herpetic pneumonias can do this, but also PCP. And that's, in fact, what this woman had. So this was a new diagnosis of AIDS for her. So again, clinical picture really matters. She didn't present like CHF or pulmonary edema. She presented more with infectious type symptoms. And with this pattern, you gotta start to think atypical. Uh, they talk about having a reticular or reticular nodular appearance to it, reticular meaning lace-like or net-like. And that just reflects those increased interstitial markings. And they tend to be pretty diffuse. This was a guy who came in the following month, exact same story, and again, didn't look very good. And this is his x-ray, and his looks different. His, on the right, you see these sort of patchy white areas. The left actually looks pretty good. When I see that in an infectious setting, you still think atypical pneumonias, but you also start to think of some other things, like endocarditis with septic emboli can look just like this, they have these little cottony patches. So we did end up going down that route. We looked for endocarditis, but we also sent an HIV in them. And this is another example of PCP pneumonia. This is more the nodular appearance that they talk about. Again, in the right clinical scenario, if this was you know, a woman with ovarian cancer or a young guy with testicular cancer, these could easily be METs, right? So the, the historical context really matters. So pneumonia. We look for things like consolidation for these low bar pneumonias. We look for the silhouette signs so we can help localize them. Look for the spine sign and respect it for what it is. Look for air bronchograms. But realize that the whole other spectrum of atypical organisms has a very different appearance and it's much more diffuse, sort of increased interstitial pattern. All right, this woman comes in, sudden onset, severe shortness of breath. She did not look good and this was her x-ray. She, there's a lot going on in this x-ray, and we're gonna sort of break it down. But just general first impressions, there's a lot of increased interstitial markings. She's got a big heart, 
that automatically, with her story, makes me start to think, is this pulmonary edema? Things that sort of support that diagnosis are, if you look at those vessels in the upper lung fields, they're too big. In an upright patient, gravity pulls the blood down, and so the vessels in the upper lung fields should be smaller. When you start to see them approaching the size of the ones in the lower lung fields, that's called cephalization. And what's happening is there's just so much back pressure that everything is backing up. You're not getting adequate venous return, so everything is sort of backing up. You see a thickened interlobar fissure. That's a horizontal fissure. That's too thick and too noticeable. That's edematous. That's full of fluid. You see this, what I call this perihilar fullness or fluffiness. You're not seeing nice, distinct pulmonary vasculature. It's just all sort of hazy. And this is along the spectrum of imaging findings in pulmonary edema. As it gets worse, everything starts to weep and become uh, more indistinct. Other things that support the diagnosis, if we take an even closer look, if you look out at the periphery, you see all these horizontal lines coming off the pleura. These are what are known as curly B lines. Most people have heard that term. And what they represent are engorged endemitous interlobular um, septa, which again is just reflective of increased back pressure and is pretty consistent with pulmonary edema from congestive heart failure. So a lot of these things sort of suggest that diagnosis. I will tell you, um, this case was particularly uh, interesting to me because I always teach my residents, congestive heart failure is really a symptom. It's not a disease in and of itself, it's a symptom of something. Something put that patient into congestive heart failure. And then this lady, she had no history of it. She did have hypertension, high cholesterol, and diabetes, the usual. And she flashed like that. And in her, if you look at her aortic arch, it's pretty heavily calcified, but that ring is not continuous. This is actually the most specific plain film finding for aortic dissection is this displaced intimal calcification here. That's actually the dissection flap, and she dissected down into her aortic root and developed acute aortic incompetency, and that's what put her into pulmonary edema. So this guy comes in, sudden onset respiratory distress. And as we go through our method, airway, he's got an endotracheal tube in. We go down, cardiomediastinum, that heart is enormous, right? He has Huge, huge heart. Uh, e for everything else. He's got pacer pads on him, right? Defibrillator pads. Somebody was really worried about this guy. He's sick. So you automatically get some clues just by going through our method that this guy is in pretty rough shape. And then when we get to his lungs, they're a mess. He has a lot of this perihilar consolidation. If we take a close look at it, he's got cephalization. He's got an engorged fissure. And he actually has curly B lines down at the base. He's got those nice horizontal lines coming off, which really supports the diagnosis of pulmonary edema. It's cases like this where the radiologists really start to hedge. And they're like, well, it could be multifocal pneumonia versus you know, pulmonary edema. And that's, again, where the historical context comes in. All right, so pulmonary edema. And you notice I'm not saying congestive heart failure because there's a lot of things that can cause pulmonary edema. So we can see cardiomegaly, but recognize that you can have pulmonary edema without it. You look for those increased interstitial markings. That's one of the first things that you're going to see. Sometimes you see a fusion, sometimes you don't. Look for those curly B lines. The more you look for them, the more you're going to see them, and that should really raise your suspicion for CHF. And look for cephalization on an upright film. All right, this gentleman comes in, sudden onset, pleuritic chest and back pain, right-sided. He's a smoker, kind of thin dude and you get this x-ray. And he's a little hyperinflated, which goes along with his smoking history. And I know it's hard to see on this, so I blew it up a little bit. I was worried about a pneumothorax on this guy, he's sort of the poster child for who gets a spontaneous pneumo. And sure enough, when you look up in the apex, there's a line there that doesn't really line up with any rib right there. And beyond that, up in the apex, I'm not seeing any other lung markings. It's very lucent up there. So this is the pleural reflection. This is the edge of the lung in a pneumothorax. The key with this is the guy was upright. It was an upright film. Air rises up. It's very different. So this one, hopefully, everyone can see from the back of the room. His entire left lung is down, and everything is starting to get shifted over. This one's pretty obvious. 
but sometimes it's not. And plain film, we'll talk about in a second, actually is not that great for diagnosing this. But there are some tips that, and tricks that we can use to try and, if we're really suspicious, we can try and see it. One of them is getting expiratory films. And so I said normally we take x-rays in full inspiration. This is one time when you can take them in full expiration. And it condenses everything down. So it pulls that lung down and it will accentuate a pneumothorax if it's there. And again, there's a pleural reflection right there that we could not see on the inspiratory view. Another trick that you can use, and for those of you who actually have looked at plain films, you know that we used to use something called a hot light, which was basically a spotlight that you would backlight the film with. And you'd look around the edge of the thorax looking for pleural reflections, and that backlight would make the lines look darker. It would make the, um, the lung markings darker so you could see them. Nowadays, with digital imaging, if you invert the image, and most of your PAX viewers are going to have a setting to do that, it inverts the image, and it will make lines jump out at you. And here, it makes that pleural reflection a little bit more obvious. It's also a neat trick, too, if you're worried about like subtle fractures. Invert it, and sometimes you'll see the fracture line sort of jump out at you. So how good is chest x-ray? It's sort of the gold, or not the gold standard, but it's sort of like the first step when we go to diagnosis. Well, it turns out it's not very good. The best is a lateral decubitus film, but nobody does that. You're not, certainly not going to do that on a trauma patient. Our upright chest x-ray, which is sort of our go-to, only 59% sensitive. Right? That's pretty poor. And then a supine AP film, which again most of our trauma patients get, it drops to 37%, which is terrible. This is where, as Rick alluded to, ultrasound is really starting to become much more useful. But if you don't have that, you're left with plain film. So that's terrible sensitivities. And part of the reason is they look different. So this was a bad MVA that came in. The person was in respiratory distress. And when you look at this film, you can't see the left hemidiaphragm at all, right? It's plunging and, and hazy and indistinct. This is what a big pneumothorax will look like on a supine film because the air rises anteriorly. It rises up in the chest, not up to the apex because he's supine. And the effect that has is it pushes down on the diaphragm and gives it that deep plunging look to it. So this is what's known as a deep sulcus sign. The other thing when I look at this patient, again, it's a little subtle, but if you look at his lung fields, the left is hazier than the right. And he's not rotated. This guy had a hemopneumothorax. It's blood layering up this way that we're seeing the lung through. Okay. So pneumothorax. In an upright patient, you're going to look up at the apex. All right. In a supine patient, look for that deep sulcus sign. Realize it may not be there a lot of the time. Now, I'm not saying you need to diagnose every single pneumothorax. I'm, I don't want people taking that message that we need to CAT scan everyone. Um, because, frankly, we don't know what to do with some of the small ones anyway. But if you suspect it, there are some tr tricks that you can try to, to look for it. This gentleman comes in, it's a Saturday night, it's like two o'clock in the morning, and he comes in and he's complaining of this sudden onset chest pain. It's pleuritic, he's a little short of breath with it, no other medical history, and we get his x-ray. And as we go through our method, we start at the airway. As I'm looking at his cardiomediastinum, I notice that there are some extra lines, and up in his neck there are some lucencies up there that don't really belong there. This is pneumomediastinum. This is air in the mediastinal space. And the lines around the heart are actually pleural reflections being lifted off the heart. This film has one of the classic findings for it, which is normally the dense heart is fused to the left hemidiaphragm anteriorly. So again, dense heart, dense diaphragm. You should not be able to see a border all the way across. In this case, we do. That diaphragm is running all the way across in a single line. And what that tells me is that now there's air in between the heart and the diaphragm. And the two things that cause that are pneumomediastinum and much less commonly pneumopericardium. All right. This was a case of pneumomediastinum. So then the question is, what was this guy doing? Um, and it turns out he was smoking crack, which is a very common reason for this. 
On the lateral, this is sort of the corollary to that continuous diaphragm sign. Here, you're able to trace that left hemming diaphragm all the way over because there's air in it. Normally, you're not able to do that. Other things that can cause it, it can happen spontaneously. It's typically from a forced exhalation against the closed glottis. So it happens in inhalational drug use. It happens in athletes, particularly weightlifters, as they're straining. I've seen that. It happens in asthmatics. It happens in cases of severe coughing. So there are case reports of this in pertussis. The one take home that I want you to take away from this though is if you see pneumomedia steinum and there's any hint of vomiting anywhere in the history, you wanna to start to think about Borhoff syndrome, which nowadays is termed uh, effort-related esophageal rupture. Because untreated, that causes mediastinitis and it's almost universally fatal. So if you see pneumomedia steinum and there's any history of vomiting, you gotta to start to worry. And, and this guy came in, he was retching and develops really bad substernal chest pain. When I look at him, I can't trace his left hemi diaphragm over. It's hidden behind the heart. And he's got a little bit of bubbly looking things down at the right base there, which I don't have a great explanation for. So we ended up uh, scanning him and he in fact had esophageal rupture. You can see there's the esophagus outlined in air, which doesn't belong. So, summary, evaluate for adequacy. All right, four things, penetration, inspiration, rotation, and completeness. Remember to be systematic. Please, please, please do it the same way every time. Train yourself to do that, and over time you won't even have to think about it, because then you won't miss stuff. Remember that the technique has huge implications on how we interpret these. Is it upright? Is it supine? And then look for those silhouette signs so we can help localize these things. Look for retrocardiac infiltrates because they can be subtle. Pulmonary edema is a spectrum of appearance, but we now know some of the findings that support that diagnosis. And that chest x-rays really are not that great for pneumothorax. So with that, I am gonna turn it over. I'm gonna hold questions uh, to the end just so we stay on time. Um, but I'll be in the back of the room if you guys have any questions. So.